Hey y'all, this is Justin again, the, the INFJ, as Cleese calls me on the blog. It's been a long time since we've done videos on here and I'm excited. I'm so excited to do some more again. Now, we have a new camera here. It's not really new, it's just less old than the other one. Um, we found it. But I'm still getting used to the image. Looks like I got a rash or something here, so we're getting used to stuff. But I figured to do a video now anyway. Um, so yeah, I'm so glad to hear that a lot of you guys have been excited about the troll videos. I'm glad those have been received well. So often, Kalisa and I will work on a post or a project or something and be like, no one's going to want this. No one's going to care about this. Um, Kalisa's most recent post as of the time of filming this um, about returning to the blog after these two months was received very, very well, at least at this stage. And we weren't expecting that. When we saw their comments, we're like, okay, here we go. But no, so it's, it's always a nice surprise when we see how you guys react well to stuff. Um, so I, I'm excited to go back and do more troll videos. Got a lot of fun ones planned. Like I said before, there's not that many troll tactics. That's kind of the thing. They keep using the same tactics over and over. So once you see them, you don't have to be confused or annoyed by them. Again, the purpose of those videos is not to help you fight with them. The very nature of a troll is that you can't. You can't win. Like Khalees commented in her post, you can't reason someone out of an argument that they didn't arrive at via reason. Reason's not what they need. Um, but because there's so much confusion, those videos are fun ways to start to, you know, start to help you see what's going on and not be, have to be confused or annoyed by it. So yeah, I'm excited to do those. Like I said, there's not very many, but there's a good number more. Uh, and there's a lot of fun ones. I got the, uh, the Whack-A-Mole coming up, the Dr. You and the Pee Wee Herman and other ones. It'll be a lot of fun. But that's not what I'm going to do right now. I want another short little series, um, prerequisite for other things that we're wanting to do, about the scientific method about when we're talking about personality typing or really pretty much any subject, the scientific method is so important to understand. And I, uh, I started this joke, the scientific method isn't dead, we just have sent it to a rest home and we never visit it. Um, it's amazing how neglected the scientific method is, especially in areas in which we kind of need it most. So this video, intro to this short little series about the scientific method, is just going to some of the basics about what the scientific method is and maybe a little bit about what it isn't. But um, a lot of you may know this stuff, but it's good to refresh seeing how it works and how it can apply to pretty much everything in life. Um, so uh, yeah, the scientific method is, it's just a basic system of what's called inductive reasoning. In other words, letting nature speak for itself. You observe things, you, I'm gonna go through all this in more detail a little bit. You observe things, you get, you, you Form a hypothesis, a guess, a, a thought about here's why this happened, here's why this worked. And then, you don't stop there. <laughs> then you have to form an experiment in order to test if that's what really happened. And then, based on that experiment, letting nature speak for itself, you refine, what you, you refine your thinking. And slowly you get closer and closer to what's really happening and a better, better understanding of what's really happening so that you can use, do more with it, use more with it. I mean, it's a scientific method that allows us to have cameras that can communicate over the internet and everything. It's awesome. So anyway, um, one of my favorite explanations, well not explanations, my favorite stories about the scientific method in action has to do with Aristotle and Galileo. Aristotle was very cool, um, <clears throat> it'd be interesting to talk about his type sometime, his personality type, but he's very cool and he liked coming up with answers for pretty much everything he could and he came up with a lot of great answers, a lot of great stuff, but for all how great he was, this was more than 2,000 years ago, and he sometimes didn't pay as much attention to scientific method, which wasn't as ironed out at all back then in ancient Greece. So, for example, Aristotle figured that a heavier object should fall faster than a lighter object. It just made sense to him. Therefore, good, that makes sense. Move on to the next answer and explanation. Aristotle has tons of these answers and explanations that make total sense, but aren't true, that don't hold up in practice. Just because something makes sense to you doesn't mean it's true. That's an essential part of scientific method. It might make perfect sense to you, fine. All that means is you have a hypothesis that seems right to you. Given all your observations you made about the world, all the deductive reasoning you've come to about the world, fine, this hypothesis seems right to you. Now we have to test it to let the world speak for itself. It wasn't for another thousand years or more that Galileo, got up on the Leaning Tower of Pisa and tried the experiment. He dropped a heavy object and a light object. And surprise, surprise, they both fell at the same speed. Aristotle had thought that a heavier object would naturally fall faster because it's heavier. 
And people just, that was accepted reasoning for a thousand years until someone said, hey, let's try it out. Let's ne let nature speak for itself. And the counterintuitive proved to be true. Now today we're used to that and that might not be counterintuitive to us. But to Aristotle, it didn't make sense that a light object would fall just as fast as a heavy object. And so that experiment <clears throat> illuminated, well, it, it, it raised all these new questions. How can that be? And it started the, the ongoing process of starting to understand what is gravity and how does it work, this idea of gravity. And the time that something's heavy and something's are light, there's something that causes that. So experimentation raised more questions, dropping those two heavy ob those two objects from the entire pizza, getting an answer they did not expect. Experimentation raised more questions and led to more understanding. So in a nutshell, that's a scientific method. You don't just say this makes sense to me and run with it. You have to test it. It has to be an experiment that's repeatable, that other people can test to, to see if, if your experiment was right. So be repeatable, verifiable. Again, they can check to see, did you go through this right? Was this a flawed experiment? Was this a biased experiment? And it has to be something that can be proven right or wrong. You drop the objects, do they fall at the same speed or don't they? <laughs> Um, so that's a really quick run through the basics of the scientific method. Now, as we're talking about experiments, you always have to take care, like I was saying, that's to be verifiable experiments, you have to take care about how you interpret an experiment. For instance, suppose someone else heard about Galileo's experiment and said, that doesn't make any sense to me. Why would a light object fall as fast as a heavy object? That makes, doesn't make any sense. That must be bunk. That must be wrong. I don't believe it. They go up on top of their house. They take a bowling ball and a feather and they try it. The bowling ball, boom, drops, and the feather drifts down slowly. Say, see, see, Galileo was wrong, proved. No, be careful how you interpret experiments, because the feather brings in a whole new question, air resistance. Two, two metal balls, one heavier than the other, have similar air resistance. You're going to have similar terminal velocities, you're going to fall at a similar rate. The feather, or say a sheet of paper, has much more air resistance for its weight, and so it's going to drift down slowly, not because gravity isn't pulling on it, because the air is pushing up against it as it tries to go down. So now you bring in a whole new can of worms to things. Be careful about that. When you're, uh, with the scientific method, when you do an experiment, be very careful about your interpretation of the experiment, saying, oh, see, no, this is proved. No. The scientific method works very slowly, very carefully. We don't say, well, you know, they did an experiment, therefore this is proven. Um, Einstein was very <laughs> emphatic about this. He said, I should probably look at the quote, get it word for word, but someone else can, can, can look at the, the word for word quote if you like. But he said something to the effect of, no amount of experimentation can prove me right. One single experiment can prove me wrong. And that doesn't apply to Einstein, it applies to all science. Um, Science can either say yes, yeah, say no, or maybe. It never says yes. So when people say something's been proven, it's a scientific fact. That's not how scientific method works. Scientific fact is kind of an oxymoron. We can have things that are so conclusive, so well supported that we that we can rely on them so well. But then there's always something new we can learn. Fact is a whole other matter. Um, and so anyway. Uh, be very care cautious when people start saying, well, it's been scientifically proven, therefore you can't even argue with it. There's always more. There's always more to learn, always more experimentation we can do. And also be careful when people say, this is kind of a troll tactic without me realizing it. Um, but uh, also be careful when people say that this makes sense, therefore you can't argue with it, therefore, there, there, therefore it's true. If it makes sense, that's fine. It's a hypothesis. For instance, I saw some people talking one time. I forget what the subject was. Um, but... It was something about heredity. This is a bad story. Uh, but, but, but one person was saying, well, you know, this is just a matter of, of this is something. I'm really telling this badly. It's just a matter of genetics, yada, yada, therefore move on. It's like, and, I had, and the person was actually wrong in what they were saying, but I knew that explaining it to them wouldn't help. So I kind of said, well, okay, that's fine. It's a fine hypothesis. Brought up that word. It's a, fine, it's a fine hypothesis, but there might be others. Let's wait and see. And the person was like, well, okay, yeah, I guess you're right. But that... that just because that makes sense to you doesn't mean it's true. There can be numerous hypotheses that seem viable that you have to wait and let nature speak for itself. And, not, and you need more than just one experiment. You need to have continuing experience of experiments to form a general coherent picture. And a general coherent picture from many hypotheses and many experiments that generally comes together kind of on its own is a theory. And it's just something's a theory, it doesn't mean it's proven in fact. No, we're always refining theories. Newton's theory of gravity was a remarkable theory, very complex. And then special relativity is so much more complex than that. Does that mean Newton was wrong? That's not a scientific way of looking at it. Newton was very correct. It works in practice, Newton's theory of gravity. Special relativity adds a whole lot more onto it that we can make much greater use of. So anyway, that's a quick crash course in scientific method. Um, we can talk about more applications of it all the time. Um, one other aspect of it in terms of experimentation and theories is a theory should be simple. 
it should be elegant because the thing is in nature things don't behave in a complex way unless something makes them do that normally things just want to go simply unless some other force makes them behave differently. So the theories that are the, the most simple are generally the ones that are closest to what nature already does. And there's a very important point about science. Nature was there before we were. Nature was there before we started naming it. Science isn't telling nature what to do. Science is trying to describe what it does so we can understand it better and use it better. Um, and so um, one of my favorite examples of this principle in action, sorry I'm messing with my hair, just getting used to this camera, is Ptolemy. Now Ptolemy is a very brilliant scientist and I think you'd probably call him a mathematician from about 2,000 years ago. Um, of course, you know, people in Ptolemy's time, long before Columbus, understood the world was round. A lot of people did. The learned people did. The, the well-educated people often understood the world was round. They knew that long before Columbus. However, they often thought that the sun went round the earth and the stars and the planets. The earth was in the center and everything spun around it. Now that makes sense when you look at it. You, you wake up in the morning, the sun comes up, it goes overhead, it goes down, next morning it comes up in the same place. Clearly. No other option, right? It makes sense. Sun goes around the earth. That's a hypothesis. That's fun. This doesn't make sense to you. doesn't mean it's true. But so Ptolemy had this very intricate mathematical measured system done by observations about exactly how the sun goes around the earth. Because, you know, it changes points in the sky throughout the year. How the stars go around the earth and how the planets, which you notice the planets didn't quite go around the earth in the exact same way as the sun. So he had to have all these intricate ways to compensate for that. Circles within circles, people call it. These orbits within orbits that, that accurately reflected the way the planets went around the Earth, according to observation. And the thing about this is it was a very valid theory. He, he took observations, he made measurements, he tested it, and then he could make accurate predictions, which is very important for any scientific theory. If you're just if you're just making a theory based on what you've seen, that's not really a theory yet, that's just observation. A theory is able to make accurate, testable predictions. So Ptolemy could make these mathematical predictions, here's where the planet Mars should be at this point in the sky on this date, and it would be there. Here's where the sun should be at this point in the sky on this date, at this time of day, and it would be there. It was a testable, verifiable theory. And yet the sun does not go around the Earth. The other planets do not go around the Earth. The heliocentric model with the sun in the middle and the Earth and planets going around it gives you the exact same predictions using an entirely different model with now they have the sun at the middle. So the question then becomes with these two competing theories, they can't both be right. Either everything goes around the earth or everything goes around the sun. They, they're contradictory and they both give accurate, predictable results. And now we come down to which one is simpler. The one with all of Ptolemy's circles within circles and orbits within orbits or just the one where everything orbits the one object in the middle. And so that's a good example of one theory being simpler than another and therefore being closer to what actually happens. And now with space travel, it's a lot easier to see that is what actually happens. However, be very careful when people are talking about, well, this idea is simpler than another. Occam's razor is a very overused term on the internet. I'm not saying it's a bad term, but people like using it and throwing it around and often using it very subjectively. Occam's razor is a term to, that says go with a simpler idea. Simpler idea is closer to what it really is, generally. However, simpler is often a tremendously subjective term. Now, in the example of Ptolemy versus the Ptolemy system of the orbits and then orbits versus the planets going around the sun, that was very, you could see one has more going on within it than the other. Objectively, one has more different compensations and special cases than the other theory. So let's go with a theory that has fewer rationalizations and special cases. That's a good objective application of, simplest, uh, of going for something that's simple and elegant. But be careful when someone says, well, my idea is right and yours wrong because mine is simple. What might appear simple and obvious to one person might seem really out there to another person and vice versa. So be careful about subjective definitions of what's simple and elegant and what isn't. So that was kind of long, but that was a good crash course on the basics of the scientific method. And before I finish, one more little thing. I mentioned at the beginning, um, I believe I mentioned inductive reasoning very quickly. Um, there are two different types of reasoning, inductive reasoning versus deductive reasoning. Uh, we like to think of deductions in terms of Sherlock or something. Deductive reasoning, one of my favorite examples of deductive reasoning is geometrical proofs. Okay, I can take a minute to do a quick geometrical proof without paper here. One of my favorite geometrical proofs that shows deductive reasoning in action. Now, deductive reasoning is not, um, is not a scientific method. It's not observing nature, testing it, and letting it speak for itself. Deductive reasoning is if A equals B, and B equals C, therefore A must equal C. There's no other way around it. Deductive reasoning is all about there's no other way around this conclusion. Deductive reasoning is a very good way to form hypotheses. 
But then, you know, as a test hypothesis, because often nature will throw a wrench in your deductive reasoning, they'll show a lot more complexity than anything you ever expected. But anyway, a good example of, de of deductive reasoning is um, you have two lines that cross like this. This is geometry. Two lines that cross like this. And you can prove that this angle here and that angle there are always going to be equal. Now, how do you prove that? You could, there, there are infinite different variations of lines that cross each other. You have one like this, one like this. You know, there's infinite different angles. You're going to test them all. You're going to measure them all. And even if you thought you measured them all, you don't know. There could be some other special case out there in which these two angles aren't equal to each other. But the thing is, if we've previously proven that, the angle, that, that this angle on one side of a line is the same as this angle on the side of the line. Now, deductive reasoning often relies on previous proofs like this. But suppose you've previously proven or accepted that this, that the, the angle, say the two right angles, on one side of the line is equal to the two right angles on this side of the line, right? Those are equal. Okay, so we have these two intersecting lines. This angle is equal to this angle. Well, then this angle here, just this, this little guy right here, is equal to itself, right? Okay, let's take this entire flat line angle, subtract this little part from it, we're left with this part, right? Let's take this entire flat line angle over here, subtract the same little part from it. So we have this, begin with the same, subtract the same, therefore these two have to be the same, always. I love that. It's a, it's a short, simple, little, elegant proof. Um, there are all kinds of great geometrical proofs. Geometry is very cool that way. There was no experimentation there. That was deductive reasoning. If this, then this, then this, and there's no way around it. If, this ang if all angles on, on the side of a straight line are equal to each other, then these two will always be equal. So it's just that's cool deductive reasoning. That's not a scientific method. I'm not saying it's not logical. I'm saying it's deductive. Inductive reasoning is more of the scientific method. Inductive is where you look at what the world shows you, and you draw conclusions from that. And you continually fine tune those conclusions based on all an experiment is, is trying to provoke the world to show you something specific. You know. You want to know what happens when you mix these two chemicals? Well, you do an experiment, you mix them, poof, see what happens? All you did is you made the, is you provoked the world to show you what happens when, these, when, I, when I mix these things. And so an experiment is provoking the world to speak for itself. So anyway, that's inductive reasoning. So deductive reasoning is awesome and great in its own place, but it's not the same as a scientific experimental proof. Now, geometrical proofs are great, but mathematics and geometry then need to be applied to the physical world, which is often much more complex. So thank you for, for um, letting me have a longer one there. There's going to be at least two more videos about the scientific method. Um, we'll see. We might end up doing a little more. Um, but I'm excited about these. This is a very important topic. The scientific method can really be applied to everything in daily life. You don't have to be a scientist in a lab coat. For instance, the mentality of the scientific method of, I'm going to see what happens. And if I do X, Y, and Z, I'm going to see what happens and then follow the conclusion of that. It's such a powerful mentality. For instance, in this, the general human pursuit of happiness, if I hit my foot with a hammer, it will hurt. Okay, let's experiment. I'm not going to do that anymore. But also, if I take this course of action in my life, I make this choice, what is the result? I think that going to Vegas and blowing all my money will make me happy. Oops, that's not what happened. Experiment, now I'm going to follow the results. Going, I did an experiment. In this situation, going to Vegas and blowing my money did not make me happy. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll have that join my generally growing theory of what makes me happy in life. Um, the scientific method is so powerful to be applied to daily life, and you'd be surprised how often we forget to do that. We don't think to do that. How often we continue in courses of action that we know from experience aren't going to help us, aren't going to make us happy. So anyway, I don't have to go into that too much right now. I can talk about application of the scientific method later. My point is, especially in terms of personality typing, and in so many other subjects that we're wanting to go into in ALBOP, the scientific method is really a prerequisite principle. So thank you all so much for that. I um, hope you enjoyed it. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm going to talk a little more about some other aspects of scientific method in later videos. Hope it's useful to all of you. Thanks.